the first thing that struck me about the movie was that it, it seems to be a, a it's a very unique blend of of western and gangster genre. Was that a big draw for you initially? Uh, yes, um, I love those are my two favorite um, uh, genres, um, and um, <clears throat> I was looking for a gangster film and couldn't find something new in that world um so when i ca- you know i, I was I, I was also separately looking to do an american western and uh yeah absolutely that that then when this rolled up it was like well it's when the west ends and the um gangster begins mm-hmm. and the the author of the source material he's a he, he he's a, a, a descendant of these these brothers, isn't he? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. His grand, uh, his, his uh, the grandson, his uh, great uncle, uh, um, was Forrest, and his grandfather was Jack. When you when you adapt uh, a, a great book such as this one, uh, is there? Tell me about the dynamic of of definitely wanting to pay honor to the spirit of that book, but but you know, obviously, you have to make some changes because it's a different format. Is that a def- difficult balance to achieve? Yes, I mean, I, I certainly had that um, very highlighted during the road experience. But mm-hmm. the one great thing, Cormac. I mean, sorry, I, I rephrase that. He said everything he said was great, um, um, but. One of the things that was the most helpful was how <clears throat> he understood that they were completely different mediums, and you know they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. Um, there's no reason to um, that uh, some books are harder to adapt than others. But I think you just I think you even said uh, I mean I think the key that makes it so um uh special is is the um uh is oh, or sorry not special is is what the key to maintain um is the spirit of the piece as opposed to getting bogged down with um and confusing the differences between the innate differences between each medium yeah. so in other words you let the poetry of words um, do their thing, and what you're looking at is how do you physicalize the characters and that world that's on that page, and what the spirit of the book is trying to convey. Um, and I do think that is possible. Yeah. Or at least I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope. Uh, I think it. I think it worked beautifully. Uh, it, it, tell me about because years years ago this project was set up, and it was a. It was a different cast outside of Shia, Shia I believe. Uh, were you on board at, at that stage, the earliest stage? Uh, right from the get-go, um, you know, I had seen in, you know, at first I was approached um, by uh, producers at uh, Red Wagon uh, with uh, doing a Sony movie, a studio, my first studio film, with the book. And I love the book, and um, and I went took the book to Nick Cave, and then uh, you know Shia was an actor that I had my eyes on since um, uh, Guide to Recognizing uh, Your Saints, um, because it um, I could see a real actor uh, lurking underneath, um, and then he got swept up in all those franchise films and. I, when I met him, you know, he couldn't sit still, and he, um, I think with all actors, you need, you know, there needs to be an element of something about them that relates to that character. Um, so there was this kind of restlessness and enthusiasm that uh, Shia had that really suited Jack, um, and then we built it. From there, uh, I mean, this was uh, it was 2008, and then the economic meltdown came, and Sony 
uh, announced that they couldn't make films like this anymore. Um, so uh, we had to go back. You know, we had a fantastic cast back then. And then, you know, as time went on, we had to re, uh, re you know, kind of hit the reset button and um, put it together again when the opportunity arose. Right. But I understand this is, Thanks. I understand it, you, it was an incredibly fast shoot. Um, and I'm curious to know if if that speed, if if there's any benefit for you in working fast like that. Well, I mean, I always, uh, I always work fast. Actually, believe it or not, I mean, the movies take a long time, but that's often due to um, uh, um, the politics of uh, post-production, um, as as opposed to the shoot. Um, the I like to try and uh, get things. I like to have. Uh, how do I put it? I like to get an energy on set. Where there really is, um, um, you know, it doesn't get bogged down. Uh, this, although <clears throat> this was an energy that, I mean, it, it certainly forces everyone to keep focus and um, put uh, a lot of pressure on. And sometimes that can be a good thing. People either rise to the occasion. Uh, and often step up beyond the call of duty and and do remarkable things um, in in that process, or or I can you know uh, go the other way. And I was very fortunate that everyone you know was got such a great cast. Uh, and really, it was you know the fact that our cast. Uh, I think rehearsal is critical to to at least have those conversations at the very least that you don't have time to have on set. And it just brought us all together and we were all, uh, I think shooting on location helped because it's almost like enforced method. Everyone sees and feels the world that we're in and therefore that helps inspire people to, you know, um, that goal that we're trying to get to. Um, so there's pros and cons. I mean, the action stuff is probably where it isn't helpful. In fact, it's definitely not helpful when it comes to action because you can't rush that stuff. You you know, it, um, it takes a lot of choreography. Safety is paramount. You have special effects that are very time-consuming. That's the painful bit. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, yeah. And I, I understood that you know the, the finale, uh, the big uh, action climax of your film was you only had a little over three days to shoot that. That's right, three and a half days. Um, that nearly killed us. I mean, the the cameraman at that point, uh, Benoit uh, Delon, who shot the proposition, fell asleep standing up. Um, so, I mean, that's how exhausting it was. Um, so I did promise everyone that I would never put them through that again. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, two performances in particular um, in terms of setting the right tone. Because when when I was watching Thomas uh, Tom Hardy's performance in the film... I, I recall the anecdote that Dennis Hopper told when he was directing Robert Duvall. I mean, he was behind the camera directing him, and he said, no, you've got to do more. You're not doing anything. And Duvall knew that you know, when you see that on the screen, it's going to read. I, I am doing something. You just don't see it right now. And, and Tom Hardy's performance is so uh, minimalist in this film. And I wanted to know about the, getting the tone of that right so that you were for sure that it was reading on camera, as opposed to something like Guy Pierce, which that role could have easily been an over-the-top, mustache-twirling villain. Yeah. Well, yeah, and they are polar opposites um, in terms of, you know, who the characters are and how they behave. Um, actually, I had the converse, the opposite experience where, making the proposition, Danny Houston, 
um, I was saying you've got to you know do less. And um, when I showed and and I showed Danny's a very smart uh, man, and I showed him the rushes of when he was in the cave area and and all these flies buzzing around him. And I explained it's also um, yeah on that big screen when he saw it. He, he instantly got it, and and that changed his whole performance from there on in. Um, uh, so I, I I totally get that and respect that, and I'm always trying to strike that balance um, with Tom. You know, with uh, the particularly that role of Forrest, the these guys, um, you know, found it um, very. Um, hard to articulate their feelings, uh, their emotions. You know, it was a different age, different like, place, and these were hard-bitten guys. And he... Um, so we talked a lot about that, um, about how that internalization and the, the stillness and the kind of pent-up uh, energy that that stillness gives. Um, Tom, of course, took that to heart and understood it in a in a way that even way beyond even me. And um, there were moments where even I was kind of concerned about how how far he was taking it. But then in the edit, I could see how brilliant that was. Um, you know, he also reduced the language to just mumble grunts. Mm-hmm. In a way, you know, that was really ever on the script, much to Nick's initial dismay. Um, but he was so expressive about it that um, it said more than actually those particular words did. Um, so he, um, but there's also a vulnerability uh, that he brought with the cardigan and the kind of mother hen. Um, but yeah, incredible internalization thing. Um, so there, it, the rehearsal process was critical when we were discussing the characters. Nick Cave was with us. We were in the middle of, of you know, remote Georgia, um, actually in a uh, school, a, 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 a religious school that we overtook as our offices. Um, Guy. Yeah, we. I actually talked about Jimmy Cagney, the way that no matter how big he was, uh, he was always truthful. Mm-hmm. And we looked at people like Capone, like documentary footage of those guys from that era, and they were like Cagney. They were, really were these flamboyant, larger-than-life, gregarious um, guys who were kind of, they were thugs, that street thugs that were given all this power. Now, in Guy's um, case, he was also trained, um, but so thoroughly corrupted and so um, uh, vain. Um, So it was really just discussing the essence of each character, and then they have their different approaches. I mean, for a guy, in fact, the way he worked, is from the outside in. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was very important. The hair, you know, he did the radical step of sending us a photo of him without eyebrows, mm-hmm. which was, you know, because, and this was all down, came out of the extremity of the character. This guy um, didn't like to be touched. He was very anal. He would wear gloves. He hated the idea of being in the country. It was vulgar and full of um, smells and texture that he didn't, you know, uh, he loved his suit. He would wear this stuff like armor. Um, And he was um, um, so kind of uh, vain that he had lost all empathy for other people. Um, and a lot of these sort of guys we analyze those sort of sociopaths that don't uh, can't uh, relate or feel what other people are feeling. And 
the extra brutality that they go to, um, and the you know the pent up frustration that he has with trying, you know, being this control freak uh, and having all this power and being so corrupted, um, you're unleashing um, uh, someone quite scary. Yeah. So it was all grounding it. I think the key in both cases was ground it in, in a reality of who that character was from those times. Um, so, so yeah, for, for Tom, it was uh, a very internalized process uh, with some external work. And for Guy, it was very much this kind of um, embodiment from the outside in. Wow. It's a terrific movie and, and, and terrific performances. And I love all your movies. And I, I really appreciate you giving me time to uh, to talk about it today. Thank you. I mean, the, also what these, all these people, I, uh, I mean, at different times, there was tonal ra- range that I um, was very enthusiastic to explore, the humor and yeah. other aspects, vulnerability, et cetera. So um, I appreciate that you've uh, you uh, picked all that up because some people haven't. <laughs>